It's my pleasure to introduce Christopher Cleghorn, Dr. Chris Cleghorn. He's from the University of Pretoria. He did his PhD there, and he is now the head of Computational Intelligence Research Group at UP. And he'll be talking about black box optimization, and he thinks nobody likes it. So let's just encourage him and say that we do. <laughs> Okay, um, in today's call, well, it's quite weird. I'm used to trying to project without having a mic, so I'll try and speak like a normal human. Um, so as I was introduced, I'm gonna be speaking on black box optimization, and in particular, I'm gonna focus on its role in machine learning, okay? There's obviously different aspects of machine learning, but I'm gonna focus on two specific areas where I think it's most commonly applied, and I think where you can maybe see a little bit of little bit of value. So the first thing I should probably actually quantify is what do I mean by black box optimization? But before I get there, I should maybe just introduce the lab from which um, I'm now in charge. We currently have five full-time staff members other than myself. Um, we work in a pretty bo broad area, okay? So we're not specifically focused just on neural networks or just optimization, we have a pretty broad coverage. Um, and we have a new postdoc starting in July with a new CERG Astro subdivision which we're setting out. Uh, specifically working with merging of AI and SCAR data to try and detect uh, exotic uh, point sources. So that's quite an interesting sub-project, but a bit distinct from here. I have to do a little bit of marketing uh, for the group. <laughs> um, so back to black box. I said that we're going to discuss black box optimization. And what do I mean really by black box optimization? Now, the name in some sense pertains to exactly what it means, but let's maybe quantify it precisely. The idea is that we have some objective function, which, with, which, you, which we are trying to optimize, call this f, but we don't know much about f. Specifically, f is completely unknown to us except for one specific aspect of that function. Namely, we're allowed to query that function for its value at a specific point. So we can feed this optimization fu or objective function f, a single point, say x, and it tells us how good or bad that point is. That's all we have available to us. Now, just to tie to kind of op the optimization you're likely to have encountered already is this also means we don't have a gradient information because we don't have an analytical function. Furthermore, it's not just that we don't have gradient information, we know nothing about that function, okay? The function could actually contain some level of stochasticity, we don't know. It could be convex or non-convex, we don't know. So we're operating completely blind. Now, when we're in this situation, the question really comes up of, how do I actually find a good solution to an object optimization problem like this, okay? How do I do that in an intelligent fashion? So that's really what black box optimization is trying to solve. So basically we made it as hard as possible to solve that function and then we go from there. That's pretty much the setup, okay? Now, most of the black box techniques that are prevalent nowadays are population-based and stochastic in nature. There are some older classic techniques that are for black box optimization that are neither stochastic or population-based, but they tend not to be very effective, okay, in the black box context, okay? Um, I would say that these are probably the five most core algorithms that other ones have been derived from. Some people will disagree with me, but there's obviously subjectivity in this. The earliest of these type of algorithms probably was genetic algorithms, um, originally uh, kind of pioneered by Hollins, though he didn't invent it, he kind of popularized it. We then have uh, particle swarm optimization, which I have a bias towards. Um, then we have differential evolution, which was introduced by um, uh, Storn and Price. We then have evolutionary strategies, but specifically the one that's popular nowadays is what we refer to as covariance matrix adaptation, ES. The idea is it tries to learn the distribution from which you sample a mutation. So it's kind of an interesting approach. Quite statistical compared to some of the other approaches, but very prevalent nowadays. And the last one over there is uh, ant colony optimization, which is more for combinatorial optimization, which is a little distinct from the other ones, which were primarily designed for, well, GAs were der derived for, or proposed for discrete-based optimization, uh, but the rest are generally designed for continuous optimization. You can use GAs for continuous as well, but that's, that's a more broad thing. I bring up these algorithms in particular as well because in our community, or in the machine learning community, we have a lot of good libraries, okay? But for the optimization side of things, that's not as prevalent. However, Facebook was nice enough to release um, a library called Nevergrad, which contains um, the top four of those algorithms implemented for you, okay? So just something to keep in mind. The API is pretty new. It didn't appear to have any bugs, but it is new, so just keep it in mind. 
So when you're talking about TensorFlow 2 having bugs, this definitely has a smaller lifetime than that. <laughs> um, so one of the things we have to ask ourselves is when would we want to use a black box technique? Okay, I mean there has to be some use case for why I want to constrain myself so much before I design an algorithm. Now, there are a couple of situations, but in general, at least one of these properties have to be true. Now, the most fundamental fundamental one is if the situation is truly a black box. If you really actually don't know what the underlying structure is, that does happen sometimes in a real world situation where you actually say, okay, well, we do this pricing structure, did people buy more or less? I don't have a system from which I can pull information from necessarily. Um, but one that's probably relatively um, important is the other one that is if we need a non-local optima, okay? Now, or at least we need a better optima than your typical local optima. Trying to find a global optimum solution is a very challenging problem. Now, neural networks obviously use gradient descent, which finds a local optima. But as you've probably experienced from all of these talks, there's some nice properties about projecting into high dimensional spaces such that that local optima tended to be global. That is not the case for many lower dimensional problems. Okay, so a lot of optimization problems we encounter do not have that magic bit of uh, features that our neural networks may have. So that's another situation where you would like to use one of these approaches. There are classical approaches that try to do it, like branch and bound, but they're very computationally inefficient. Because many times in this situation, our kind of cost of using the algorithm is the number of times you query that function. That's really your computational budget in our situation. How many times can I query that function? And the classical approaches tend to over oversample. The other situation is maybe taking a gradient is not possible or infeasible, okay? It might be too hard or too computationally expensive for the dimensionality of the situation to take a gradient. Or perhaps you're trying to optimize some really complicated PDE and inside that there's some really complicated gradients that take a bunch of approximations themselves to find. In that situation, this might be a good fallback to go onto. And in the last case, particularly in the combinatorial optimization, the traditional way in which you would go to one of these algorithms is if the known algorithms for finding optimal solutions are NP. What that means is that they can only be computed in non-polynomial time. So like your typical traveling salesman problem. They cannot be computed in polynomial time. So we need a heuristic kind of guided search to give us a good enough answer. Okay? Because we can't brute force our way to the perfect answer and we have no more intelligent way of doing it. Okay. So I just want to give you a little illustration of a classical example that people put, bring up in optimization. This function over here is what's referred to as the restringent objective function. Here, we've removed the blackness from the box, but something I just want to illustrate is that that function itself in 2D, as we normally optimize in higher dimensions, but say it's in 2D, has a very clear uh, convex macro level structure. However, from a more micro level structure, we have all of these minimal or these other convex hulls. Okay, which means if I were to follow the gradient, I would get stuck in one of those. And maybe I'm trying to maximize my profits. And why will I accept profit of that amount if I want that much? Okay, inverse of that amount. Okay, invert of that amount. <laughs> um, but the thing holds true for many practical examples. We want the best solution we can get. Okay, so that's why we need to kind of go to these approaches. Now, the question now is how do these black box optimization algorithms work? At least in the abstract principle. Now, we've encountered throughout this course, or not course, this, this session, multiple instances where people have used gradient descent or Adam or some gradient based optimizer. But in truth, most optimizers follow the same kind of prototype, if you will, where you have a position. So you have your X of T, your current position in the search space. And all you are trying to ascertain is where should I move? So what direction? That's the P. And how much should I move? Which is the X. So where should I go and how much in that direction should I go? That's all optimization algorithms are fundamentally doing. Now, if I consider something like gradient descent, it falls into that thing exactly the same. My direction is my negative gradient, and my step size, or how far I want to go in that direction, is simply my learning rate. Okay, so all we are actually trying to decide here is ways of building that SP without needing gradients, because we don't have gradients. If we had them, we would probably try and use them. But if we don't have gradients, we should actually try and find an intelligent way of constructing that SP. And that's what all of black box optimization is really trying to do, is trying to use sampled information, because normally they're population-based approaches, so I sample across the space, and I'm trying to use that population-based information as an in intelligently to derive some structural information that can inform my choice of where to move and how much I should move. 
Okay, so that's what we're really trying to achieve. Now, if you do know genetic algorithms, for example, they don't quite look like that, but you can easily reformulate their definitions to look exactly like this. There's a bunch of analogy wrapped around it, but at the bare bones level, they all boil down to this kind of structure. Okay. Now, I'm going to quickly run through one bare bones optimization algorithm to just give you a feel for how they work. Okay. We're not going to go into great detail about all the varieties. I just want to give you a feel for how one works, and then we're going to jump straight into the machine learning kind of use cases. So kind of how it would kind of work. One example, there's a lot of these algorithms, but a, a relatively prevalent one, and then a real case usage of these. Okay. So PSO uh, is a stochastic-based population search algorithm, like all the ones I mentioned. So we have lots of candidate solutions looking through the search base at the same time. Very different from a single point search. So it's called a multi-point search approach. Now, it was originally developed in 1995. Um, their analogy was that they were trying to simulate movements of birds, um, but in some sense, when you see the equations, it kind of corresponds to a stochastic nonlinear. Um, I forgot the word. <laughs> <laughs> Simpl yeah, non uh, stochastic nonlinear simplex method. Sorry, I'm not using used to having to link the two across different domains. Um, now. <laughs> The idea here is that each particle or candidate solution will just represent a specific instance which you are trying to test whether it's good or bad. Okay? And so the idea is you have all of these points and they all represent your candidate solutions to your optimization problem. And we want the particles to be guided, so that SP, by using the experience that they have acquired during their search in addition to what other people in their population have also or obtained. So we're trying to share information amongst all of the point sources. So they're not all independently trying to search. They're trying to communicate in some intelligent fashion to get an approximation of both the macro and micro level structure of the problem. Okay. Now, I bring up here so because it's incredibly easy to actually define that step without having to rearrange the equations. So we have our population, so it's not a single individual, that have been initialized across the search space. Say it's uniform, but there are different approaches to that as well. And all we want to do is we want to calculate this V. Now, all that that V is, is a weighted sum of three things. The first is basically what was referred to as a momentum term. So if I'm progressing in a certain direction at a certain speed, and I get new information from the swarm of where good locations are, I might not want to completely disregard where I was going. So it's kind of like momentum in your typical gradient descent. It has a similar kind of regularization role to the movement pattern. The other two are really the, the crux of the approach. The first term over there is basically trying to guide the particle in the direction where it remembers success. So Y, without the hat, is what's referred to as the personal best position that that particle has ever encountered during its search. So there's a, an update there to direct you back to where you found good success. They refer to this as the cognitive influence. Now, the other informer is what comes from the whole population. So that's the Y hat, which is the position where which has the best fitness in the whole swarm. Okay? Now, the idea is you're trying to balance between exploiting on that information directly or maybe trying to have a balance between what you know and what somebody else has found to be effective. Now, both of those operations are weighted using stochastic terms, specifically that R1 and R2 are just component-wise or vectors with component-wise randomness, sample from a uniform distribution between 0 and 1. Now, the idea then is that we actually are generating a distribution of possible positions we can go to, but those positions or that distribution is informed by the global structure that we are getting from our memory of where something was good. We don't want to just lose it if it was decent in the past, and where my neighbors have found something good. In this case, it's the whole swarm. There are variations of using sub-connected structures, but the traditional approach is just you communicate across the whole swarm. The algorithm is completely contained in that slide. Okay, There's no extra fluff. That's why I put it there. So we update all the fitnesses. You update who's the best in your neighborhood. In this case, it's the whole swarm. You update those two equations, and you repeat. That is the entirety of that algorithmic approach. There's a lot of theory to make things work better. However, that is all that is required in this situation. So don't think of black box optimization approach as being orders of magnitude weirder than gradient descent. Okay, They're very much actually in line with how much is actually required of you. So that's kind of to give you a feel of what black box optimization is and one 
optimization algorithm. Does anyone have any quick questions to maybe clarify things on how that technique kind of works before I go into other applications of these techniques? Just so I can weed out any uncertainty. Yeah. Uh, w, C1, and C2 are what they call the control parameters of the, the heuristic, in essence. So they are problem dependent normally. What's the optimal ones to pick? So you obviously need to be optimizing something higher dimensional than three. Normally 10, 20, and higher dimensions. But those are control parameters of the algorithm. Or actually, in more neural network terms, they're the hyperparameters of the algorithm. I think that's maybe a more appropriate term for the, for the area. Um, but there are nice criteria on them that if you pick them in certain regions, you get good results. So there's a nice bit of theory backing what's good values for them. Okay, yeah. Well, no, basically what's happening is I'm taking, yeah, I'm taking a sample from the whole region, okay? Taking a sample from that whole region, and now I'm intelligently deciding where I should look next. So what happens is I'm using the information. So say, let's, let's use a real world example. So say I'm sitting over here and I know my fitness is 10 and your fitness is 50. And I know that information and I'm at my current best position. Now I could move anywhere or I can say, well, you have a score of 50. Maybe if I move towards you, my fitness will improve. So that's the idea that I'm sampling a distribution that is biased towards an area that is better. So I'm not taking infinitely number of samples. I'm taking a single sample biased towards where I know things are better. So that's the idea. So it's not quite the same as I just keep on sampling randomly. I'm biasing the search as it goes, and it's getting updated with the new information of where good solutions perhaps are. Does that mean you have to decide this number of samples that you're going to take into before? Yes, in, in, in some sense, that's your computational limit of the approach. Like all optimization techniques, you say, how many function evaluations do I get? So if I'm saying, is this approach better than that one? We can sample a thousand times in a 50 dimensional problem, and who gets the better one? And you could do it randomly, but it's not going to inform your search at any point in time. So this is an intelligent way of controlling those distributions from which you sample in some sense. It's more of an abstract layer on what I'm discussing, but that's really what's happening. Cool. Okay. So now we have what black box optimization is. We have one algorithm, and now we can start looking at some of the applications. Now, one of the areas where I see black box optimization often attempted, though we'll discuss pros and cons of using this approach in this scenario afterwards, but I'm going to just go through one of the, the nice success stories about it. Um, just kind of illustrate that what is assumed to be the truth is not necessarily the truth with these approaches. Now, black box optimization has been used for reinforcement learning type problems, so control problems, uh, kind of for as long as temporal difference method has existed. They've existed for a very long time in this realm. And you obviously have people rooting for either, either camp. Um, now, the fundamental distinction, from my perspective at least, but Benji can correct me when I'm wrong, uh, <laughs> is that... Black box optimization approaches search directly in policy space. So let's consider this very simpli simplified version of the Pong game. The idea with a black box optimization approach is I'm directly searching in weight space. So I'm trying to directly search in weight space for what are good weights that will allow me to play well. I'm treating this entirely in some sense as a black box, as the algorithms were designed. Whereas RL is a little different. It searches the policy space via a value function. Okay, so there's pros of using that approach, but there are certain computational limits from a parallelism perspective doing that as well. Okay, so that's the fundamental distinction, direct policy space via the value function. Okay, and I'll discuss one of the benefits of going via the value function though towards the end. Now, recently, OpenAI had somebody that was on the more evolutionary side of the camp. Um, was able to utilize evolutionary strategies. So it's a kind of stripped down version of um, the normal evolutionary analogy. I don't want to spend too much time going through the steps, but a very simple, simple version of it. To effectively solve the Mojo Co control problems, basically you have um, some kind of creature like this that you need to move as far as possible in the area. There are different variations, but in this one, it's basically trying to see how far it can move. How quickly can I get from point A to B in a certain amount of time? Can it move further? Now, they were able to use evolutionary strategies to evolve architecture, or not architecture, just the weights in isolation that can solve 
both these problems and the Atari games. But how do they stack up? Solve is a relative term. Who did better, in some sense, is the real question we're trying to ask. Now, what they found was that the evolutionary strategy approach was better than state-of-the-art on 23 of the 51 games. Now, that's not surprising, because if anyone's worked with optimization for a while, you know what the no-free-lunch theorem is. There will be some problem instances where certain algorithms will be better than others. There's no one algorithm to rule them all, as it were. Okay? Now, what is interesting about this result is that they use it as an illustration that it demonstrated that evolutionary strategies can perform well in incredibly high dimensions. Okay? Now, a caveat to this statement, because a lot of people are pushing this, this part of genetic algorithms, it works, but I don't think it's the strength of black box optimization. Okay? In my mind, the strength of black box optimization is that it is able to solve hard, lower dimensional problems. Those neural networks are thousands and thousands and, or millions of number of weights. That is not the realm where black box optimization is at its highest strength. And I'm going to go to situations where it is actually better suited. Now, in terms of this result, there were two caveats that they didn't mention as frequently as the first one there. The one thing is that it was not as sample efficient. Basically, reinforcement learning gains more information from a game, at one playthrough of a game, because it's learning as it's playing. So it's trying to estimate the value of individual states in the game of Atari, for example. Whereas what the, G, or the evolutionary strategy in this sense is doing is it's fixing weights, playing to the end and saying good or bad. Okay? You lose a lot of information. But given enough computational time, it can still do well. But it has sample inefficiency compared to RL. So that's something to keep in mind. So if you have enough time, you can get good results, but it is sample inefficient. The plus side, however, is that you are actually able to parallelize this very easily because you can evaluate the fitness of all of those individuals on separate GPU nodes if you wanted. So you can parallelize it very trivially. Okay, so it's a quite a nice thing. If you needed to do a lot of computation, you can parallelize it really, really well. So now I said that I actually think that's not the best location to use evolutionary strategies. My feeling is that they are better when we have hard, lower dimensional problems. Now, lower dimension doesn't mean it's three or four. I'm talking 100 or less kind of dimensions. But you can do a lot in 100 dimensions. Most of the problems you make as a machine learning user are in that range because you're not optimizing the weight yourself. Okay? You're optimizing other things like the hyperparameters and the architecture. So that's where we're going to really try and go to illustrate the effectiveness of black box optimization. Now, one of the biggest challenges with machine learning, or at least from my perspective is one of the biggest challenges, is there's too much choice. Okay? You have so many choices, it's a little overwhelming to decide exactly what to use and when. And in some sense, machine learning has become a form of alchemy. I'm, Google employee stated it, so it has to be true. But many, many researchers have had the similar kind of sense. So basically, oh, I want to do a classifier. I'm going to start with my neural network, add some convolution and a, black, a bit of uh, batch normalization and great. But it does feel a little bit like I'm chucking things into a pot and hoping things work out. Okay? And we need to try and find a better way of, of trying to address that situation. Now, I want to illustrate how many choices we really have. Sometimes when we look at situations like this, though we know there's a lot of choices, we don't really fully realize or understand how vast the com combinatorial space we're really making a choice in is. So some of the typical decisions that we may have to make is how many layers should a neural network have? What activation function should we use? Sure, everyone uses ReLUs, but there are, if we have recurrent networks, is, should I use GRU? Should I use different types of nodes? All of these things are, are choices I have to actually come up with. The other thing is what layer types? There's so many layer types now. You have convolutional layers, you have attention layers. There's a lot of layers, and every year you'll get another five from the next NIPS conference. Okay? <laughs> Now, the other question that is not answered as frequently is also what optimizer should I even use? So am I using gradient descent? Am I using Adam? And I'm, am I using RMS prop? Adam doesn't work best on everything, despite what a lot of people want to claim. Again, no free lunch is a real thing, but we need a way of making these decisions. Okay, so let's work in a confined example. So let's say I've made a bunch of decisions, or my supervisor told me to make these decisions that I'm not arguing, and I have to train a classifier that's, I'm going to just use a feed-forward neural network 
20 hidden layers. Supervisor doesn't know of convolutional layers yet, so 20 hidden layers. Um, ReLU activation functions and softmax output layer. I've decided Adam is fine, and I'm gonna use ultra regularization. And I've also decided that the max width of my layers is 15. All I wanna decide is, should I go from big to small? Should I allow the number of uh, units in each layer to vary? So I just wanna pick that number. That shouldn't be so bad. I'm just picking how wide each layer should be. Now, that's quite a big number of possible, <laughs> possible combinations. Because I have 20 layers, I have to have a deep network, that's the thing, so I have 15 to the power of 20 possible combinations that I can work with, okay? That's a lot of things to test. Now, this is what your supervisor gave you. He said you had a parameter tune, so you're like, okay, fine, I'll just try them all. Now, if each one takes 0 0.01 seconds, this will take us 10 to the 14 years, okay? Now, in this situation, what do you actually do? You obviously can't brute force search. You cannot take a gradient back up to this value, so you can't use something like that. We need a different way of trying to solve this problem, and that's where we can start employing black box optimization. What I've described can easily be encoded as an optimization problem. All I need to say is what's my candidate solution look like, the encoding step. So in this situation, I have 20 layers, and all that they are is they can contain for each layer a value between one and 15. And all I'm trying to do now is find the optimal vector that gives me the best error. So in this case, it would be what gives me the best error on my validation set. Please don't use this on your test set, okay? which would give me the best error on my validation set. And then I optimize for which vector to use. And I'm not brute forcing, I'm not trying everything, I'm trying to intelligently search this space, which is computationally expensive to search, such that I can get a better architecture than I could have figured out myself if I was just trying random combinations. Okay, so that's a simple way in which I can try and optimize a choice. Now, this is a very simplistic example because I've removed a lot of the choice. What if we try and make it a little harder? What if I don't want to just pick the width of these layers? What if I want to do something like build the whole architecture? Now that's what order ML is really trying to answer is learn or devise what's the best architecture for a given problem, okay? And try and figure out to do that without the necessity for a machine learning expert to tell you exactly what to do. And let's also be honest, even if you're a machine learning expert, you don't want to be spending that long looking yourself, even if you can cut it down by orders of magnitude, okay? Now, in my opinion, there are arguably two pioneering algorithms for evolving neural architectures, okay? So now the encoding is a little bit more complicated. I'm not gonna waste too much time going into how you encode it, but you can understand that you can encode it in a, in a fashion such that you can optimize it. Now, the two approaches that are super popular and are, in my sense, the more pioneering ones are NEAT, which stands for Neuroevolution of Augmented Topologies, and also HyperNeat. HyperNeat had a clever idea where it said, well, the encoding of these is pretty hard, so it tries to learn the optimal encoding as well. Okay, so it's quite a step up. Now, I could go into detail of how those two algorithms work, but I can demonstrate to you using two recent studies that without even that level of complexity, we can get great results from these approaches. Yeah. Is there um, some sort of like rigorization techniques for black box optimization algorithms to avoid overfitting in the same fashion as screen optimization has? Um, yeah, I suppose in that context you're talking about if I'm talking, doing supervised learning with... Yeah. Fundamentally in that sense you have the error, your error term is your fitness. So you're trying to minimize in that situation. Yeah. You can add L2 for that and there'll be no issue. You can technically feed it the same ideas as you could a normal approach. But my personal opinion is, in a situation where you have an actual error, perhaps don't lean on these methods because you have all these nice properties of that situation where you know okay, the local optima somehow seems to be magic in this situation. We can always find it with gradient descent. So I wouldn't, in my mind, pe people will disagree with me in this field. They like these techniques to work for all problems. I'm not that, okay. that in mind. There's different situations for different problems. I wouldn't advise using these approaches to learn weights in a supervised context. You can learn architectures and things like that, but I wouldn't learn the weights. Okay, Hyperne tries to do weights and architecture, which is going a little far in some sense. But what I'm gonna describe is not necessarily doing the weights, it's just doing the architecture. Does that answer your? Yeah. 
Okay, great. So I went on a bit of a tangent from what you asked, but. <laughs> um, so as I was saying, we can go into detail about how neat and hyper neat work, but I think it's maybe more informative for me to use a simpler approach to demonstrate the effectiveness of this idea, okay? So I'm gonna go off two recent results from Google, and I use them because they have so much computational power they can demonstrate things on a scale I cannot. Unless somebody wants to fund me, that's another thing. Um, <laughs> now, we're gonna demonstrate how effective black box optimization can be for ML by trying to evolve simple architectures for two data sets, CIFAR 10 and CIFAR 100. I'll do ImageNet at the end. But CIFAR 10 and CIFAR 100, if you're not familiar with these data sets, so CIFAR 10 is a very large data set, well, relatively large data set, of 60,000 images, smaller images, 32 by 30, and they fall into 10 distinct classes. CIFAR 100 is the same data set size, but you have a far finer grain distinction between classes. We have 100 classes, so that's quite a challenging problem to solve. Now, what we want to do is see if we can evolve an architecture that can give us state-of-the-art-like results on those two data sets. Now, the approach that's used is to evolve a simple architecture starting with a very simple core network. So the seed network is a single layer model with no convolutions. The way this evolution plays out is a lot like genetic programming where you're building a graph-like structure over time. But the same analogy is exactly the same as before, same context. Now, I wanna start from a population of single layer models with no convolution and I wanna try and build into full architectures. I want to evolve into full architectures. So how do we do this? Well, the approach used is really, really simple. So we start with the initial population of these trivial seed networks. So remember, population-based search. We evaluate the fitness of the individuals in the population. So we run them. We train them with whatever optimizer we're using. In this case, we're not picking that part of AutoML. That's the one side that they, they decided not to do. Um, we train the architectures on our validation set, which tells us how good or bad that architecture is, how well does it generalize for us. Once we've evaluated all our individuals, we start with our evolutionary loop, if you will, and all that happens here is I randomly select two individuals in the population. The worst of the two is killed. Okay, it's a bit of a rough system. Um, while the better of these is allowed to asexually reproduce. It's not the most efficient setup either, but nonetheless. So they fight and then the one reproduces with himself. Um, <laughs> After which, a child is created by making a copy of the stronger individual, so the one that survived and deemed the parent. And after the copy is made, a mutation is appended to that child. Okay, so some mutation is done. I'll go over what mutations were considered in this problem. Now, this is a very stripped down evolutionary model. Normally, there's a selection criteria of multiple people to make. Um, so for example, you have a population set size of N. You do tournament selection to select best individuals and the like. The reason this approach was used is this is incredibly easy to paralyze because I just pick two randomly, make a child, and that one I evaluate how good it is and repeat. So it's very easy to paralyze this cut down version. It's one of the justifications of this approach. Now, the allowed mutations were the following. You will see in the later one, there's not as many allowed mutations, but basically we allow a bunch of things. So, and the mutation is relatively simple though, is we randomly select one of these options, okay, from some uniform distribution of integers, and we simply do the corresponding step, okay? We insert convolution at the end of the architecture and proceed, obviously it has to fit, but there's a little bit of technical detail to make it work, but it's not too bad. We also have options where nothing changes, alter the learning rate, change the stride, and so forth, okay? Small little tweaks that we can alter to the structure, but nothing too major. Now, if you let that evolve, until your boss says, give me back your servers, or my servers, we end up with the following situation. Now, I will say in this situation, it is not beating state of the art. However, from that simple structure on CIFAR 10, we're getting 94.6% accuracy on the test set, okay? With 5.4 million weights. Now, in my mind, compared to the closest one that's pretty decent higher up, and the ones that were better suited for CIFAR 100 have a considerably larger amount of weights. But 94.6% is pretty good considering no expert had to design that. You didn't have a grad student generating ResNet for you by trying this by hand. 
Okay? This was done automatically with no expertise. Now, if we consider the score that I get on, or they get rather, on CFAR 100 plus, we end up with a 77% test accuracy, which again is not quite at the level of these huge architectures, but at this level, nothing was predefined. This was all evolved from those simple structures. Okay? So if you had a new problem that you didn't have years to spend evolving an architecture, or building the architecture yourself rather, you could use a strategy like this to try and guess a really good solution for you. Okay? Considering that that beats ResNet by a big margin, I think it's a reasonable approach. Okay. Now, at the moment, I haven't beat state-of-the-art, but we will beat state-of-the-art by confining our search, actually, and in quite a, a nice, nice fashion. Now, something I'd like to point out about this approach is you see here that we have the test accuracy on the left, and this is basically wall time, so how long this thing was able to compute. And you see there's this rapid spike in accuracy. Now, I mean, if you were short on a computational budget, you could always stop this process when you start hitting a plateau. But you can see here that we start with this very simple network. At this point, we're starting to get a more complicated structure where you can see I've got a convolution, batch normalization, and a ReLU layer. There's another skip condition just to make things interesting. But as things go more and more to the extreme, and I'm starting to eke out those last little percents, I start getting these more and more complicated structures, which is very much akin with what we see the handcrafted architectures doing. To get that last percent, they have to go radically bigger. Okay, so we see the same kind of situation occurring. But the idea here is that we actually quite rapidly get this acceleration, okay, where we actually are quickly able to get pretty good architectures. So if you're on a short time period, you can get decent architectures without having to run down the timer to get to that point. Okay, if you have the time, use it. But if you're in a situation where you don't, it is something to consider. Now, that approach was very broad in the sense that you could build a huge variety of different architectures. It kind of was an unconstrained search. One of the issues, however, with that is that there's many ways you can expand in a bad way. Okay, you kind of increase the degrees of freedom maybe a little too much. So let's constrain the approach a little and see how well it can do in the constrained context. Okay, maybe it can actually do better with less freedom. Constraint breeds creativity, and clearly the neural network thinks the same. Okay, now the general construction of this reduced architecture, which is called NASNet, you'll see it in a lot of AutoML situations where they confine the approach to this general format. So basically I have an imp my input, which gets fed through two different kinds of layers, where I have a normal cell followed by a reduction cell, normal cell reduction, normal cell, and then eventually my output. In this case, it's softmax. Where the normal cells are not individual cells, but rather n of them stacked on top of each other, each with a skip condition between. Now, this is the overarching structure we want to evolve within. So what do we want to evolve? Now, all that we actually are allowed to evolve in this structure is the content of the normal cell, and the content of the reduction cell. And that is repeated. We can't have different reduction cells or different normal cells. We're just evolving those two cell types. Now, there's obviously some certain constraints that are obviously gonna be in place there. Specifically, the normal cells are constrained to have the same, or constrained to have the same, sorry. Uh, Sorry, yeah, it's at the bottom here. The reduction cells basically have to reduce, so they have to have a stride of two. They have to actually reduce. Yeah, five months, okay, cool. They actually have to reduce. So that's a constraint of reduction. It's a fair constraint. I mean, it wouldn't be a reduction cell otherwise. And the normal cell cannot dimension reduce. It has to have the same input to output. So any other constraints we impose. Now, in this context, we have to be a little bit more careful of how we evolve the cell. So you're basically building up the internal connections of the cell. There's a nice encoding for that, but it's gonna take a bit long to explain. But the idea here is that we evolve those normal cells and reduction cells and see how good of a network we end up getting. So how do we do on CFAR? So there's only results for CFAR 10, but you will see in this situation, by the way, if, sorry, N is the number of stacking there. F is the number of times we duplicate the structure of normal cell reduction cell. So there are two parameters that are being ticked up in this process, okay? Now, in that situation, we get test error of 3.4 for the one version of the model and a slightly more tuned version, we get 3.34 test error. So we're very much in line with the other approach, 
We're a little bit better, but it's kind of negligible. Well, aligned with the other state-of-the-art approach. Okay, this is actually better than the original approach that evolved, but we're in line with state-of-the-art in this situation. What is interesting, which I think is worth mentioning, is I said in a situation where I was learning weights for a network, reinforcement learning was more sample efficient than the black box approaches because it was using intermediate information. So it was intelligently using what it had available to us. So as you were looping, you, got, you estimated how good that given state was. In this situation, what we find with the evolutionary approaches is they are actually more sample efficient than the reinforcement learning approaches and get better on the top end than RL, but admittedly there is a slightly larger degree of variance. But if you're picking only the best, then it's not really an issue. But the big distinction here is that in this context, we're actually more sample efficient, which is why I contrast the two areas. When I'm learning weights, we're losing sample efficiency. Here we are not, okay, which is why we seem to do better in this, this context. Just for a baseline, you see over there, that's a random search. So to your question, that is if somebody did a blanket random search architecture selection compared to both RL and the black box approaches. Okay, so we now have seen how well I can do on CIFAR, but how well can it do on ImageNet? Because I mean, that's, that's the big one. What we see here is that the two trained models that we're actually able to devise are actually able, this was published on the 19th of February this year, if I'm not mistaken, is actually able to beat state of the art simply by involving in that constrained structure, okay? So we're actually able to beat state of the art. The ones in the middle here were learned using uh, reinforcement learning type strategies and the one on the top are fixed hard-coded uh, architectures. But the important thing to note here is that we're actually able, particularly on that last one there, to beat state of the art, specifically in the top one, okay? Now the important thing here is machine learning expert didn't design those cells and how they should work together. We just evolved two cells and from that we were able to get this really good generalization ability. Okay, so that brings me to the end of what I wanted to discuss. So thank you for your time and do you have any questions? Cool, thanks Chris. Any questions? Should we just do, okay, start here. Hi, thank you for the really great talk. Uh, so I'm just wondering, uh, at a, at a high level, um, how does this sort of approach, um, what does it entail for interpretability of models? Yes, um, it's a fair question. What I've encountered, not so much with these models, but things with um, super sampling and things like that, is that if you give the architecture or the evolutionary strategy a fair bit of free range, it does make decisions that we would not even make. So you'll see that it will still like tan age sometimes. And you're like, okay, I thought this was proved to be bad. So it starts making decisions that we would not make. But in terms of an interpretable situation, it's maybe less structured, but I would argue I'm not sure how less interpretable it is than some of the weird architectures we have devised ourselves. So that's kind of my, my feeling on that. I, it doesn't assist interpretability, I will say that much. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, hey, uh, thanks for the great talk. Um, two questions. How much computing power did that actually take to sort of evolve those, um, uh, those models? And also, how do the models that the genetic algorithm sort of evolves compare with human-generated human models sort of in terms of style and maybe some redundancy or things we haven't thought about? Okay. Um, one, well, in terms of computation time for the ResNet one, it was 256 hours, but that's using um, that's using Google's infrastructure. So <laughs> I'm not saying it's used all of the infrastructure. I'm not saying that, but it is using Google's infrastructure. So I wouldn't say it's nothing, but that's why I pointed to this curve. So for a, a real, a person, I'm gonna say a real person, because me, but <laughs> <laughs> if we try and do something like this and we don't have time to fine tune, we may stop when we start getting decent results. Whereas if you have as much compute as you need, you can keep pushing down. But the quick thing is the gradient is such here that you get pretty good relatively quickly. Uh, in terms of your other question, I, in terms of weight usages, we have, have some numbers here. Um, so this was for the more general approach where it could evolve a lot. You see there's a general thing here where we use very similar number of weights. 
except obviously there there's 40 million for the CIFAR 100, but that's in line with kind of the numbers they're using. It's kind of in between the three approaches. So it's comparable in, in some sense. The other for ImageNet, we look at that with the simpler model, we are using kind of on the upper bound there and we are using a lot more weights on the bottom, okay? But at the same time, because we are beating state of the art, it seems to be the run of the course that to try and get that last fraction, you keep on having to go orders of magnitude larger. In terms of the things they do that's odd, which is less odd now, was more odd earlier on with order ML, is they had a high tendency to like skip conditions, which we now know is relatively a reasonable thing to use, but back then it wasn't as prevalent. Okay, that's the only thing that I've noticed that I'm like, okay, this is a bit odd, which makes a lot more sense after the fact. Uh, I'd like to know your thoughts on uh, Bayesian optimization or things like hyperband, how does it compare to the evolutionary approach? And here you're also mentioning just uh, architecture, I mean, search. How, what are your thoughts on, instead of just using one algorithm, including many other algorithms? Well, I'll try and, okay, in regards to your first question, you're talking about Bayesian optimization of general things or you're talking about architecture space? If it's one, raise your hand. If it's two. <laughs> okay, uh, there have been some groups looking at uh, maybe hyper, I mean, optimization in general, mm. I think also fits into black box. Mm. They use Bayesian optimization in general, not evolutionary algorithms. My general impression from a lot of them is they look different, but at the core, they're kind of the same algorithms. They came from different angles. Um, I have, particularly if I look at CMA, yeah, all the way back. If I look at CMA ES, so I'm gonna put it there so you can see the reference afterwards. The covariance matrix adaptation, in some sense, it's learning a prior on the distribution from which it should sample the mutations. So there's a strong linkage. In terms of using a lot of algorithms, my general feeling is I don't evangelize any one algorithm. Each problem has a better suited algorithm. So I wouldn't say use this always. It depends on your problem. I'd pick a set of general ones and try and benchmark across that and pick the one that worked for your problem instance. I wouldn't say always use this approach. Most of the people in my field will shoot me for doing that, but that's really the, <laughs> the way it goes. But those Bayesian approaches work relatively well. The issue is I'm not sure if all of them scale as nicely as this. You'll see with the C CMA ES, there's a lot of weird tricks they do to make it scale. Cool. Thank you. Okay, let's thank Chris one more time. <laughs>